Okay, so if you have your Bibles, um, please open to keep opening to uh, Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to uh, study that passage this morning. Am I audible at the back? Okay, good, thank you. Um, I have a genetic disorder because of which my body produces extra unnecessary triglycerides, which is a type of fat. In order to keep my triglycerides in control, I have to take one pill every day. Same tablet every day. The tablet does not cure me completely, but it helps me to get through the day until I take another tablet. The repetitive use of that tablet reminds me constantly of my sickness, my illness. I wonder how many things we do again and again and again without getting full success. Uh, things that constantly remind us of our deficiency, of our flaws. Can you th think of certain things? Can you think of those things that we do repeatedly without getting uh, complete success? Thankfully, there is one thing that we don't have to do again and again. We don't have to sacrifice animals again and again for the forgiveness of our sins. Jesus' unique and ultimate sacrifice once for all saves believing sinners from their sins. And that's the main point of this passage. Jesus' unique means only one of its kind. Jesus' unique and ultimate sacrifice saves believing sinners from their sins. The letter to the Hebrews was written to the first century Jewish converts who were being tempted to leave Christian faith and go back to their old religion. So earlier, these people were Jews. Uh, they were following Judaism as their religion. But then they became Christians. And now they are tempted to leave their Christian faith and go back to Judaism. There were several reasons why they were tempted to go back to Judaism. One of the reasons was that the readers, these Christians, they were being persecuted because of their faith. Uh, they were facing hostility because of their faith. And because of this persecution and hostility, they were tempted to leave their Christian faith and become Jews again. Because once they have become Jews, they will no longer face persecution because Judaism was an accepted religion in the first century Roman Empire. So they were tempted to leave Christian faith and go back to Judaism. And perhaps another reason why the readers were being tempted to leave Christian faith was that they were missing the Jewish sacrifices and ceremonies and festivals. Uh, since they had become Christians, they accepted, they embraced Christian worship, which was pretty simple in comparison to the elaborate Jewish sacrifices and festivals and ceremonies. So they were tempted to leave Christian faith, Christian worship, which was simple, and go back to the seemingly attractive Jewish worship. So what does the author of Hebrews do? The author of Hebrews writes this letter to such readers in order to exhort them to not leave their Christian faith. The author displays the superiority of Christ over all the elements of the old covenant and Jewish worship. The author exhorts the readers to not fall away from the Christian faith. 
I'm using this word author again and again because we don't know who is the author of Hebrews. That's why I'm using the word author again and again, and you will hear it more as you hear the sermon. In chapter 9, which is just the previous chapter, the author says that the sacrifices of the Old Covenant. Now, the Old Covenant simply means the Old Testament, right? I'm distinguishing between the Old Covenant, which is the Mosaic Covenant, the covenant that God made with the Israelites through Moses. That's the Old Covenant. With the New Covenant, which God initiated through the Lord Jesus Christ of which the Lord's Supper is a symbol. Baptism is a symbol, right? So uh, in chapter nine, the author of Hebrews says, the sacrifices of the old covenant, the Old Testament, did not bring believers into the presence of God. It did not bring. Whereas the blood of Christ effectively cleanses people, believers, once for all. In chapter 9, the author speaks about the necessity of the blood, the, the necessity of the sacrifice. You remember that famous verse, uh, chapter 9, verse 22, in which the author says, without the shedding of the blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. That means if one has to be forgiven, then the blood has to be shed. Without the shedding of the blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So in chapter 9, the author talks about the necessity. It is necessary for the blood to be shed. But when we come in chapter 10, the author talks about the nature, the character of the sacrifice, of the sacrifice that actually forgives sins. Okay? We, now, we are convinced that the sacrifice is necessary. We are convinced that the blood has to be shed. Now I tell you in chapter 10 what that sacrifice looks like. What is that sacrifice that actually forgives sins? Um, in chapter 10, the author contrasts the Old Covenant, the Old Testament ceremonial laws with the sacrifice of Christ. And in doing so, he proves the superiority and the effectiveness of the sacrifice of Christ. Now let's have this broad picture in our mind as we approach to study this uh, chapter. There are three sections. The first section begins at uh, verse 1 to 4, chapter 10 verses 1 to 4, and it speaks about the inadequacy of the Old Testament sacrifices. Now that word uh, inadequacy, don't be <laughs> intimidated about intimidated by the, the inadequacy simply means that it is not sufficient it's not able it, it, it's it's not uh, able to do something right so the inadequacy of the Old Testament sacrifices the author says that the ceremonial laws in the Old Testament you know when we read Old Testament we will find so many ceremonial laws so many things that is uh, ritualistic uh, people used to do again and again, right? So the author says that the ceremonial laws of the old covenant was only a shadow of the good things which were going to come, right? You know, when an object blocks the rays of light, so you must have seen the shadow, right? When is the shadow formed? The shadow is formed by a certain condition. There has to be light, there has to be an object, that blocks the light and that object then produces a shadow at the back, right? So this condition. So what the author is saying is that uh, the ceremonial laws in the old covenant is only a shadow of the future good things which were going to come. The author is saying that the salvation in Jesus Christ Okay, is that good thing? And it casts shadow behind in the old covenant. And that shadow is reflected in the ceremonial laws. Okay, and I, I hope you're getting this. The shadow was reflected in the ceremonial laws. 
So the Old Testament ceremonial laws was only a shadow. Okay. Now think about this. The shadow can give us some clue about the object. Okay. How many of you have seen shadow? Let me see your hand. And those of you who have not raised your hand, have you not seen shadow? I'm sure you must have seen shadow. <laughs> There's every one of us who has seen, who have, who have seen shadow. So, um, you know, shadow, uh, what good the shadow is? Uh, shadow, if we have seen, uh, we can only, when we see the shadow, we can only tell uh, certain things about the shadow. For example, uh, when we see a shadow, we can tell whether the shadow is of cat or dog or man or woman, right? But the shadow in itself is not the reality, okay? The shadow in itself is not good for anything else apart from giving us some basic information, right? Are you with me? Are you okay? If you see a shadow of banana, that will not fill your stomach. You need real banana, right? Are, are you with me? Okay. So the author of Hebrews is saying is that the shadow in itself is not good for anything apart from giving us some basic information. In the same way, the ceremonial laws in the Old Testament, okay, gave people some clue, some basic information, okay? But the ultimate sacrifice of Christ is the real good thing. The shadow gave us some clue, some information of the thing which was going to come, which is the ultimate sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the shadow, the ceremonial laws could never actually save people. We know that the saints in the Old Testament were saved only by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who were the saints in the Old Testament? People like Noah, people like David, uh, Joshua, uh, all these other saints who were there in the Old Testament, they were never saved by the sacrifices. They were always saved by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the Bible clearly says there is only one God and there's only one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus. And the sacrifices of the old covenant merely pointed to the ultimate and sufficient sacrifice of Christ. In the old covenant, the Bible says, the same sacrifices were offered every year. It simply pointed to the fact that none of them was sufficient and able to forgive sins of people. Now the author of Hebrews argues that if those sacrifices were sufficient to cleanse people, if those sacrifices were effective to forgive people, then they would have been seized by now. But the repetition of those sacrifices year after year simply pointed to the reality that the worshippers were not cleansed. And because of that, the worshippers in the Old Testament, they had continued consciousness of sins. You see, friends, the sacrifices in the Old Covenant only covered sins, but never provided forgiveness. Now, somebody at this point might raise his hand, okay, and register an objection, okay? Somebody can say, okay, if that is the case, then why did God give those sacrifices in the first place if they did not serve the purpose of forgiveness of sins? The author of Hebrews assumes that kind of objection. The author of Hebrews knows that this might be some objection. So he answers that in verse 4. So if you have Bible, please uh, keep it open. Let's read verse 4. It says, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. In those sacrifices, there was a reminder of sins every year. 
right? Verse 3 and 4. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So what was the purpose of those sacrifices? The purpose of those sacrifices was not to forgive sins, but it served the purpose of reminding people of their own sins. Every time, every time a Jew saw an animal sacrificed and its blood shed, he should have been reminded of his sins. Okay? So think about with think with me. Okay? Are you with me? Uh, when people come, when, let's say I'm a Jew. Okay? And if I committed sin, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. If I committed sin, who should die? The wages of sin is death. You commit sin and you die. Right? If I did sin, if I commit sin, who should die? Should he die? No. Who should die? I should die. Right? But then I commit sin every day. I commit not only one sin every day, I commit several sins or many sins every day. If that is the case, then the whole world will perish because everyone has sinned. So what does God do? He provides a mechanism. I did sin. I committed sin. I should die. But in my place, an animal is sacrificed. Okay. And when an animal is sacrificed, his blood is shed. I am reminded. This animal is not dying because it sinned. It's, this animal is dying because I sinned. It reminded me of my sins. Okay, it reminded me of my sins. And every year, every time I bring a goat or a bull or a pigeon to be sacrificed, the innocent animal is sacrificed, it reminded me of my sin. That's the purpose. So it reminded people of their sins, but that reminder is not the end. Because it should lead people to then repentance, right? It should lead people to repentance. I am sinful. God is holy. And because of that holiness and because of the justice, sin has to be treated. So that should have led me as a Jew to repentance. Reminder, repentance. Then the third step. It should also lead me as a Jew to hold on to the promise that the sacrifice of the bull, the sacrifice of a goat or a pigeon does not forgive my sin. Because it is only pointing to that ultimate sacrifice of someone who will come and because of whom I will be forgiven. So every Jew when he saw the animal sacrificed, when he saw the blood shed, he was reminded of his sins. He should have been led to repentance of his sins. At the same time, he should have hold, held on to the promise that one day God will send a sacrifice, a lamb that will fully and finally deal with my sin. That was the purpose of giving those sacrifices. God never intended, never intended that the blood of bulls and goats would take away sins because it was impossible. Right? So as you come to church, you don't find any altar, you don't find any animals, you don't find any bloodshed here. Right? Why? Because they can never ever forgive sins. The old covenant sacrifices were completely inadequate, completely insufficient to save those for whom they were offered. The second section begins at verse 5 to 10, the superiority of Jesus' once for all sacrifices. Twice. Remember this word, once for all, okay? After having laid down the inadequacy of the old covenant sacrifices, the author now proceeds to explain the superiority 
Uh, what does superiority mean? It is superior, okay? The superiority of Jesus' once for all sacrifice from verse 5 to 10. The author explains why the death of Christ was absolutely necessary. Here he links Jesus' incarnation with his death. Uh, notice here in your Bible, the author quotes from Psalm 40. Uh, if you see in your Bible, there will be some description in the end or somewhere which says that this whole passage, beginning at verse 5, is actually taken from Psalm 40, which is a Psalm of David. David understood the truth that God desired obedience more than sacrifices and offerings. David understood that obedience is better than sacrifice. Uh, now, it's not that God was particularly put off by the sacrifices and the offerings because he himself instituted those sacrifices, those offerings. What God did not like was that those sacrifices and those offerings were done without faith and obedience. That's what happened in the Old Testament. People came and they brought bulls, they brought goats, they brought pigeons, and they thought, okay, this is what God wants to bring a sacrifice. Here it is, take it. They did not have faith. They did not obey, right? But God was put off by that. God never wanted sacrifices and offerings to be a substitute for faithful obedience. King Saul failed to learn this lesson. The people of Isaiah's day, Prophet Isaiah's day, did not learn this lesson. And it was a sad story of all the Israelites all along. And here, the author of Hebrews puts David's words in the mouth of Jesus. Think about this. It, the Psalm 40 is a Psalm of David. The author takes the words of Psalm 40 and puts it in the mouth of Jesus because he knows that those words that were ultimately fulfilled in the incarnation and death of Lord Jesus Christ. Think about this. It was God who prepared the body of Jesus. Who gave the body to Jesus? Uh, Jesus was not born because of uh, uh, sexual intercourse or the way how all the kids are for, uh, made or born, right? It was God who gave the body to Jesus. It was God who made the conception in the womb of Mary possible. And Jesus was incarnated. Jesus came into this world to do the will of his father. Now here we must understand, understand that one of the things that make Jesus' sacrifice on the cross unique and significant for salvation was that his sacrifice was in perfect obedience to the will of God. So it is not simply the death of Jesus, but death of Jesus in perfect and faithful obedience to the will of his father that saves sinners. Why is Jesus' death unique and significant. I mean, so many people die for their country. So many people die for good cause. So many people die by say, uh, because of saving lives of others. Why is the death of Jesus unique? Why is the death of Jesus different? Why is the death of Jesus can save sinners? It's because his death, his sacrifice, was in perfect obedience, in faithful obedience to the will of his father. Father desired that he would die on the cross and Jesus died on the cross in accordance to the will of the father. And that makes the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross unique and significant and sufficient to save us. Now Jesus' faithful and obedient death on the cross did a remarkable thing in salvation history. In fulfilling the will of his father, Jesus displays the repetitive old covenant and sacrifices with his once for all sacrifice. Okay? Now, the old is gone. The repetition of the sacrifice is gone. 
Now there's only one sacrifice, which is once for all done by Jesus. Now the good things have come. The shadow is gone. The shadow, which was only a shadow of good things to come, the shadow is gone. The perfect has come. The object has come. The good things of salvation have come. The shadow is displaced by the reality of good things. The author argues that the sacrifice of Christ began a new era. It's a new age. It's a new era, which, made, which meant that the old is gone. The climax of his argument comes in verse 10. Believers are now sanctified. They are cleansed through the once for all sacrifice of Jesus' body on the cross. Now sins are not merely covered, they are actually forgiven. Okay? And that's a blessing. Now believers are not constantly reminded of their sin, but when they partake from the Lord's table, they are constantly reminded that their sins have been forgiven because of the cross. Right? When we enter into church, is there anything that reminds you of your sin? The pastor or the church does not place anything that constantly reminds you of your sin. Right? But when the table is there, when the bread is served, when the wine is served, when the juice is served, symbolizing the, the body of Christ, the blood of Christ, what do believers do? They have the assurance. Not simply that they were sinful, but yes, they were sinful, but they are now forgiven. The body is broken, of which the bread is symbol. The blood was shed, of which the juice is symbol. Right? And the believers come with assurance, and they go with assurance that their sins are forgiven. They are guilt-free. Their conscience is not bothering now. Their guilt is not eating them up. They are forgiven. They are free. They have, they have bold access to God now. That's a blessing that Jesus has done for us. What a blessing of the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, one pastor summed it up like this. The death of Christ became that great and final sacrifice that accomplished for eternity what an eternity of other sacrifices could not accomplish for time. Let me read that again because it really sums up well what the author wants to say. The death of Christ became that great and final sacrifice that accomplished for eternity what an eternity of other sacrifices could not accomplish for time. The third section begins from verses 11 to 14. The author continues to contrast the repetitive old covenant sacrifices with the Jesus' ultimate once for all sacrifice. Uh, every Jewish priest stands daily and offers the same sacrifice over and over again. But those sacrifices could never take away sins. But Jesus is our high priest. He offered one unique sacrifice for sins of all time. And after having done that, he sat on the right hand of God the Father. My dear friends, please notice this. The multitude of priests over hundreds of generations offered countless number of sacrifices. But on the other hand, Jesus, our only high priest, offered one sacrifice only, only once for all time. And that ultimate sacrifice of the Lamb of God took away the sin of the world. Hallelujah. What an amazing sacrifice. Never did a death of one man achieve so much. Never did a death of one man counted so precious. And after having done that, what did Jesus do? He's not standing like other Jewish priests. He sat on the right hand of God the Father. And it simply means that his work is finished. His work is complete. His sacrifice is accepted by God the Father. The work of salvation is over. Believers have been forgiven. And that's what he wants to say. Verse 14 says, By one offering, Jesus has perfected all the born-again believers. 
that means he he forgave all the born again believers who are being sanctified my dear friends what do we learn from this passage um, there are several things that we can learn first of all the only sacrifice that saves us is the sacrifice of Christ on the cross did you hear that the only sacrifice that can save us is the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ not our own sacrifice not the sacrifice of our parents not the sacrifice of our well-wishers but the sacrifice of Christ is the only sacrifice that can save us secondly when we look at the cross when we think about the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ we are reminded of our own sins we are reminded how wicked how cruel and how evil humanity can be but that's not it we are also reminded of the forgiveness we have received because of the blood that was shed by the Lord Jesus Christ we are reminded of the sufficiency and finality of the sacrifice of Christ and since the sacrifice of Christ is sufficient it is also final because we are we are not waiting for any more sacrifice to come do we no we are not wa waiting for another Messiah to come we are not waiting for another one Lamb of God to come and being sacrificed no we are not waiting for anyone the sacrifice of Christ is sufficient and final the sacrifice of Christ is sufficient for my salvation and I don't have to sacrifice for my own salvation did you hear that you don't have to sacrifice for your own salvation and anything that God asked me to do and here is a third application anything that God asked me to do is not a sacrifice okay but a privilege that I get to do something for my Savior it is a privilege that I can do something for my Lord Jesus Christ whatever I do for my Savior the Lord Jesus Christ is not a sacrifice but a token of gratitude for all that I have received from the Lord Jesus Christ and fourthly no ritual no sacrifice is greater than the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross okay we do a lot of things in church we do a lot of things in Christian ministry but none of those things is greater than the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ only because of that we have forgiveness of sins people may be may fall into the temptation that okay I received forgiveness from Jesus Christ in the first place but now I'm running the race because of my own strength and that's a great temptation to fall in we prize grace so much in the beginning but as we become mature in Christian faith as we find our place in the church the grace becomes smaller and smaller and that's a big temptation we must understand that from the beginning to the end and all the way in between we are relying upon the sacrifice of Christ for the forgiveness of sins never never ever in your Christian life you think now I can do on my own we rely upon Christ that's why we sing the song before the throne of God above I have a strong and perfect plea we can stand before the throne of God and we have a strong and perfect plea not because of our own strength but because of the Lord Jesus Christ because of him we have the strong and perfect plea none of us is from Jewish background so we don't feel the temptation of going back to our own own religion but going back to our own old habits uh, going back to our own old sin sinful habits can be a temptation for us but the author of Hebrews wants to encourage us that Christ is more precious 
Christ is more worthy of honor. Hold on to Christ. Hold on to your Savior. And don't fall into the temptation of going back. And finally, my, de my dear friends, if you are not a born-again believer, let me encourage you to consider Christ, who became man. Jesus became man. And he lived a perfect, obedient life. And he died a death that he did not deserve in order to save sinners. If you feel convicted that you are a sinner, it's a work of the Holy Spirit. If you feel convicted that you are a sinner, come to Christ and embrace him, hug him, accept him as your only savior. The Bible clearly says that whoever, it could be you, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. My question to you this morning is, are you saved? Have your sins been forgiven? Have you benefited from the once for all sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ? Or you are trying and trying and trying without success to please God. My dear friend, let me tell you, you will never be able to please God on your own. You need the sacrifice of Christ. You need the righteousness of Christ. You need a savior. You are like a person who is fell into the ocean and you don't know at all how to swim. You need a person to save you. Without that savior, you are drowning and drowning into the depth and the pit of the ocean. And there will be a day when you will breathe your last. You need a savior. You need a savior, Jesus Christ, to save you from that fall. My dear friends, this is my prayer that you accept the Lord Jesus Christ because he alone is the savior. 20 years ago, I accepted him as my savior. I was born in a Hindu family, grew up in a Hindu family, worshiped idols, was into the cycle of rituals and all the other things that the Hindus do. But I found myself as a complete failure. The New Testament told me, the Bible told me about the only savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit worked in my heart. I came to know that I was a sinner. And I also came to know that Christ is the only savior. I did not lose the moment. I did not lose the opportunity. I accepted him as my savior. And since then I have been Christian. And my prayer is that you may also find Jesus as your savior. He is not the savior of your parents. He is not the savior of your pastor. He becomes your savior. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for this opportunity to come to you. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that you have spoken to us from your word. And Father, we pray that we may be able to appreciate the value and the worth of the once for all ultimate sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Without his sacrifice, we are doomed to failure. We are doomed to hell. But with him and because of him, now we have access to you. We can call you father. We can call you Abba. You are our father and we are your children, Lord. And it's only because of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that we are saved. We thank you that we are heading in right direction because of Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, father, we pray that Lord, you help us uh, to live a life worthy of the gospel, to live a life worthy of the life that you have given to us, the eternal life. And if there's any person who is not saved, my prayer is that, Lord, you would save him or her and that, Lord, you open the heart of that person, that that person may be able to accept the Lord Jesus as his or her savior. In Jesus' name, we offer this prayer. Amen.